Hi, this is Rev Ed with today's Back Porch Devotional from Psalm 44. O oh God, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You with your own hand drove out the nations, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arms save them but your right hand and your arm and the light of your face, for you delighted in them. You are my king, O God, ordain salvation for Jacob. Through you we push down our foes. Through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. But you have saved us from our foes and have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continually and we will give thanks to your name forever. But you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. You have made us turn back from the foe and those who hate us have gotten spoil. You have made us like sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You have made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock among the peoples. All day long my disgrace is before me and shame has covered my face at the sound of the taunter and reviler, at the sound of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you and we have not been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Yet you have broken us in the place of jackals and have covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself, do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust our belly clings to the ground. Rise up, come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. This is a powerful and painful psalm, and it's another one written by that group called the Sons of Korah. And we don't know the circumstance that led to its writing, but the psalmist begins by relating what God has done for his people over the years. And he refreshes everyone's memory at the wonderful things God has done in delivering them from their enemies. But now the situation is different. Now their enemies are running roughshod over them. And the hard part is, it is evidently not because of the unfaithfulness of Israel. In verse 17, he says, all this has come upon us though we have not forgotten you and we have not been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back and nor have our steps departed from your way. And so the psalmist is wrestling with this terrible reality that even though they have been faithful to God and they have not worshiped false idols, they have not done anything outwardly uh, that goes against God's law. They know they're not perfect, but they know too that they have been attempting to be faithful to God and yet still evil and junk have come upon them and they are brutally beat down and there seems to be no relief. And the psalmist is asking two things. He's, why, why is this happening, O Lord? And please, please come save us. And this is a hard place for the faithful to stand. Sometimes we know that trouble comes upon us because of our own stupidity and selfishness and sinfulness. And sometimes trouble comes upon us because the world is just a broken place and there appears to be just random evil all over the place. But sometimes trouble comes upon us precisely because we are remaining faithful to God. Jesus said, if they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. And that's the reality that we have to deal with. If you're going to stand up for the ways of God, for the truth of God, the honor of God, the world is not going to appreciate it. And we don't want to be obnoxious in standing up for these things, and yet we must stand fast uh, when the world tells us that things are a certain way 
And we can tell from God's word and from the person of Jesus that it's not at all that way. And so when we stand against the world and its strange ideologies and the lies that have been bought and swallowed by everybody else, it seems, we're going to come under the attack of the world. And we just have to know that God is still at work. He is still holding fast to us. And he is working out his purposes, even through our suffering. And so we have to remember that no matter how hard it gets, God is at the center of it. This is what that great passage from the eighth chapter of Romans is all about, beginning at the 28th verse, where Paul says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And right there, we have the purpose for whatever it is we're going through, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The purpose is that we might be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That is how all things work together for good. It's not for our immediate good necessarily. It's not that the things that we go through are all good, not nearly. But we can trust that God is at work in them to bring us into conformity with the image of Jesus. We are being transformed from sinful human beings into the likeness of the Son of God. And I don't know about you, but I'm fairly certain I do not resemble the Son of God much at all any. And so there's a lot of transforming that has to take place. There's a lot of earthly junk that has to be chipped away and purified out of me and perhaps out of you as well. But then Paul continues. He says, what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, and here Paul quotes from Psalm 44. For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what God is up to in our lives. And all the trouble that we experience, if we enter into it properly, will be used by God to shape us into the image of Christ. This is the great hope that we have and the confidence that we have. We are not being abandoned. We are being transformed. And while that transformation is often very painful and suffering, a lot of suffering goes along with it, we have this confidence that God is at work within us. This is why James writes in the first chapter of his letter, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Your perfect wholeness, your shalom, your resemblance to Jesus Christ is what God is at work in you even through suffering. We don't go looking for suffering and we don't try and create suffering, but the suffering that comes will be used by our Lord to transform us into his image that we might glorify him. We can recognize then that everything does indeed work for our good and we can give him thanks for that. God's blessings be upon you this day.